Good afternoon or good morning or good evening, depending on where you are. This is Abby with Shapiro with uh, all of my other friends here that I'll introduce in just a second. We're excited to have you on our webinar today. Thank you so much for joining us. So let me go ahead and dive right in. I'd like to present your host for our webinar today. Uh, as I said, my name is Abby Duffield. I am the Ecom Implementation Manager. I'm going to go ahead and let everyone introduce themselves in turn. Um, I'm Marissa Kern, also with Shapiro. I'm a compliance analyst here, as well as a licensed customs broker and CCS. My name is Max Leahy. I'm with Private Label Hero, um, and I'm a product creation and launch expert. My name is Jacob Canfield, and I'm with Private Label Hero, and I'm a marketing expert. So now you've got some voices to the name for our webinar that we are doing today. I'd like to start everybody off with just a little bit of information about Shapiro so you can kind of get to know us, and we'll have Private Label Hero introduce themselves here in a second. Shapiro is located in Baltimore, Maryland, and we were founded back in 1915. We are a women-owned enterprise business with a couple of different offices there along the East Coast. We are a freight forwarder and customs broker, and we have a very strong compliance background along with using our great tech support team to make innovative solutions for our customers that we love. We are excited about e-commerce, and we've been involved with it for almost eight years now and counting, um, and we really do love what we do. So Private Label Hero was founded by myself and Dr. Jacob Canfield. We basically founded this to teach anyone who wanted to create their own private label business. Using our 15 years of combined experience in the store and e-commerce marketplace, we've created Private Label Hero to be the most comprehensive private labeling, private labeling course available. The Private Label Hero course not only walks you through how to actually source products, and, but it actually shows you how to create your own brand as well as providing simple step-by-step -step instructions on how to sell and scale the products on Amazon and in-store. All right, so we're gonna go over what we're gonna be hitting on today's menu. Uh, you might have seen some of it when you clicked on the advert to come in, but I'm gonna review it anyway. We're gonna cover the biggest importing mistakes and how to avoid them, best practices for messaging and dealing with foreign suppliers, customs entry and U.S. partner government agencies, how to ensure your product is perfect for samples, delivery day, how to verify your order is correct, and how the new Section 301 Chinese tariffs could and probably will affect your business. So let's jump right in. Biggest importing mistakes that we see is that they're the product that you're bringing in hasn't necessarily gone through all of the vetting process that it should have. So there's something when you're having a product come into the U.S., it has a tariff number or a customs tariff number that is associated with it that not only tells you what the duty rate is going to be, but what the import requirements could be for that product. Sometimes when people are bringing in products, they don't necessarily double check to see do I need to have anything from the FDA? Does my product have anti-dumping on it? So there are things here that you want to check out for, and we're going to go into some more of those in just a second. Making sure that you know what your term of sale is or what your INCO term is with your supplier. This is a handshake in terms of who is controlling what and who is responsible for what in the shipping. We're going to go over that in a second as well. Another big mistake is not having a customs bond set up before importing. This is a big one. If you don't have a customs bond set up before you start importing, what may happen is, is that if you are shipping via ocean, you need to have something called an ISS file before your shipment leaves. If it's not filed, you can be subject up to, up to $10,000 in U.S. penalties and fines. But in order to even get that ISS file, you've got to have a customs bond in place. So we're not even talking about the entry for when it comes into the U.S. We're talking about before it's even left. If you're shipping via air, you don't have to have an ISF bond, uh, an ISF to worry about for your shipment. But if you don't have a bond in place for when your shipment arrives, your customs entry is going to get held up, and you could be looking at very expensive storage delays and storage fees for not having that bond in place. Asking a customs broker more about what kind of bond is best for you is a great idea to do before you get started. It's always good to review your planning times for shipping. Part of this is knowing what you're looking at for when you are reviewing a quote for the transit time and considering certain things along the lines of 
Is my shipment getting picked up from the door or from the port? What is my delivery set up like? Considering to have some extra time that's put in there in terms of weather and other congestion delays. We're gonna go over more of that in just a second as well. But first, let's jump right into IncoTerms. So thank you, Abby. Um, to get started, IncoTerms are the international shipping terms that define who is responsible for risks or costs at the different stages of the shipping process. Um, so it's really showing where the liability changes hands. The less liability you have as the buyer, the more your seller will have, which means you would have less control in that situation. When talking with your supplier, you should really make sure that you're confirming what is actually being included in your invoice. If you're being told you're paying for CFR terms of sale, and then you see an additional charge for ocean freight, that means you're now paying for that ocean freight twice. So something to keep in mind when discussing these with your supplier. So each INCO term has its own sets of pros and cons. Um, where you'll see DDP will have your supplier cover everything from start to finish, if they forget to apply for certain export clearance, you're going to get, in, get end up stuck with waiting for your cargo. If you are arranging the export terms of sale, you'll be in control of everything start to finish, which means if anything does go south, all the risk lies on you. The INCO terms also tells your customs broker and customs what fees are being included in your invoice total, and it can also tell us what's being considered as non-dutiable charges. For example, if you see terms of sale on your invoice as CIS, we will need proof of the amount of the insurance and the freight. If that isn't provided, then we won't know what actually was paid for in regards to your terms of sale, and FOB could have been used in this situation. Long story short, ask your supplier what is exactly included in your fees. Typically, FOB is the easiest because it's a solid mix of cost-effective versus control of your own cargo. Thanks, Marissa. We're going to go over the transit times and timelines here with this really great walkthrough. So for the XWorks term that you may have seen in the last slide, this is a good example for something along these lines where you have a door-to-door -door move, meaning that we're starting all the way for your shipment with you in control from your supplier's door overseas, taking it all the way to the destination door. And just to kind of give an example, for the one that we have up here, this is a shipment that's going from Australia to the U.S. So in this case, we're picking up from a supplier in Australia, we're getting it onto a boat, taking that boat into the U.S., having the container come off up in Canada, most likely, railing down to Chicago, doing the customs clearance, and then getting it delivered to Amazon. When you're looking at a quote, the transit time that you're going to see on the quote is going to be port to port, so that orange section in the middle there. And that time could really depend on several different factors, most of that being how far does the cargo need to go. Different lanes have different speeds and different transit times. So when you see that number on a quote, don't think of that as being this is going to be the only number I have to worry about for the transit time. It's just one part, as you can see. There's onboarding to consider as well. If you're shipping via air, that onboarding time can be between three to five days. And that not only includes the pickup time from your supplier, but also getting it to the airport and getting it loaded and ready to go on that plane. Ocean freight can take a little bit longer. Ocean freight takes between seven and 10 days, pick up from the supplier's door included, most of the shipping anywhere internationally happens a week in advance. So if a boat is leaving this week, the cargo was most likely loaded last week. Anything that's leaving next week was loaded this week because there needs to be time to have that shipment put into a container if you're doing an LCL shipment or a less than container load shipment or have that full container load get ready to load onto the vessel. There are certain loading requirements that are involved in terms of putting containers on a vessel, so seven to 10 days is something to keep in mind. For the delivery, you should consider weather, congestion, and other unexpected events to occur. Now, unexpected events I know is a loose term, but anything from having steamship lines go bankrupt, which we've seen in the past, to longshoremen going on strike, which has caused big issues, to right now we're looking at hurricanes. So having extra delivery time budgeted in is very important. Beyond all of those other delay factors I just mentioned, something to consider is how you have your delivery set up. If you are having 
for a direct example with Amazon, because there's a couple of different ways to deliver with them, if you're having Amazon take care of the delivery, that delivery time can range depending on whether it's going to be a small parcel delivery or it's whether it's going to be a larger palletized delivery. Normally we see that be anywhere between three to five days, if not five to seven days, depending on what type of rework is needed. So if your cargo is coming in and it's loose cartons, and it needs to be put onto a pallet for delivery. That's gonna be a couple of extra days of work and labor to get that ready to go. So just to review transit times again, uh, a couple of like spot points to hit there. Make sure that when you're looking at a quote, you understand that your transit time is going to be port to port. Make sure that you are considering other things with that transit time for the onboarding and the delivery. Keep delays in mind, holidays, congestion, exams, they can all play a part in what your timeline is going to be. So it's better to start sooner rather than wait later. When you're looking at something along the lines of air versus ocean, deadlines versus I don't really have a deadline, it's best to always be transparent with your forwarder and ask them what they have for their knowledge, their best expectations with your shipment. Remember that extra services can take extra time. So if you need to have your shipment palletized or labeled or any kind of extra services happen there, that's going to take extra time. Remember that it's always time versus money. The faster you want it there, the more likely it's going to cost more. Ocean takes a long time to get there, but tends to be the most cost effective. Air has a very short transit time, but tends to cost much more money. All right, guys, so I want to talk to you about best practices when dealing with foreign suppliers. Now, when I mention foreign suppliers, I'm mainly talking about China, but this really does apply to any foreign supplier you deal with. But a lot of stuff I'm going to go into here relates to Alibaba in particular, which the majority of suppliers on there are from China. So the first, as Abby previously discussed, is really know your timeline. Know your port to port times. Understand that it will probably take, um, you know, a week to two weeks to have it loaded on the dock, to have your factory delivered to the ports in China or whatever foreign country you're in. Really realize that you need to make sure that you have a big leeway of time that you're not gonna run out of inventory. Because as you know, if you run into inventory on Amazon, it causes a big problem. You lose a massive drop in your BSR, you have a lot of issues, your competitors pass you, it takes a long time to recover from that. So always know your timeline and know that delays can happen. So on Alibaba, one of the best ways to find great foreign suppliers and make sure that they're really vetted is through the settings. So on the left-hand side of Alibaba, when you log in, there's a settings bar. The settings that you want to make sure that you have checked are gold supplier. And all this means is they, uh, the supplier paid Alibaba to be on Alibaba.com. They paid to be a gold supplier. But a lot of them you'll find have a gold supplier badge of five or 10 years. That means they've been with Alibaba a long time. They've gone through a lot of transactions most likely you're less likely to have a problem with these suppliers. It's a good place to start. The next one is trade assurance. This basically gives you protection on Alibaba for your orders. What that means is up to a certain amount of money, Alibaba will actually ensure that your order is delivered successfully, nothing's broken, um, the order is up to spec of what you ordered, that kind of thing. And the last one, which is the best, is called on-site checked. An on-site check means that Alibaba's representatives actually went to the factory and checked that they truly were a factory and not a middleman. A lot of these suppliers that list on Alibaba as suppliers truly are not, and they're just middlemen for the actual suppliers. That means that you're going to end up paying a higher price than going directly to a supplier. So when they have on-site factory checked, that means that they are 100% a supplier and you're going to get the best possible price from them. The next is asking the right questions. So there's a few questions we always recommend to ask. This is when you start a conversation immediately with the supplier. You want to ask, what is the MOQ or minimum order quantity? That's basically going to tell you what is the smallest possible amount that you can order from the supplier and still get that order shipped. Now, generally, this will mean that you can order this amount if you're changing minor aspects of the product. 
such as packaging, labeling, um, uh, colors, or any other small aspect. Now, if you want to change the actual size of the product or key features, a lot of times that will require a mold. Keep in mind when you have to do a mold that you're going to pay money for the mold itself, and you'll also pay money. You'll have a sorry, you'll have a higher minimum order quantity. So the next question you want to ask is pricing on different quantities. That's where a lot of people make a mistake. A lot of people ask for the minimum order quantity and they stop there. Once you get that minimum order quantity, you want to ask how much, if the minimum order quantity is 1,000, ask how much it'll cost if you order 10,000 units. This way, in the future, you know that when you start selling a lot more, you'll get a price break down the line. The next is lead times. Another question you want to ask in your initial email. Normal lead time from a factory is generally between 25 and 35 days, depending on quality produced and the modifications that you're making. If a factory says 60 days, it means that they're either extraordinarily busy or there could be a lot of other factors, such as them not really producing it and they're going through a middleman. But if you use the on-site check, you won't have that issue. But those lead times really play a big part in your ordering, especially when you get down the line, you really start selling and your minimum order quantity was 1,000, you ordered 1,000, you sold 1,000 units, but now you need to reorder. Well, if it's gonna take you 60 days, figure 60 days for the production, then another 30 to 45 days in shipping and getting it to you. That could be a big issue if you run out of stock. So always have those um, lead times written down and try and negotiate for around 25 to 35 day lead time. The next thing you wanna look at is shipping terms, which we previously discussed by everyone on the webinar. The best shipping term you can have is FOB as previously discussed as well. There are a lot of other INCO terms. Each one of them are different, have different meanings. I always prefer with any supplier that I'm gonna deal with to get FOB shipping terms. The next is your payment options. Um, sorry, we discussed uh, custom, customization and private labeling. Packaging options. Packaging options are a big part as well. Always talk to the supplier and see what packaging options they offer. Some of them might offer only a poly bag. Some might offer a poly bag or a box. Ask them how many colors you can apply to the label on the color box or the poly bag. All these things are gonna play into your price. So know what packaging options there are and know what packaging options they're gonna charge you for before you ever get in bed with the supplier. The next is payment options. With payment options, the one thing I want to point out right off the bat is never, ever, ever use Western Union. 90% of the time, if a supplier wants to use Western Union, they're probably not even a real supplier. They're probably just going to take your money and run. It was very classic 10 years ago or five years ago on Alibaba. People would pay through Western Union and never see the money again. The payment terms you want to use are what's called TT, which is a wire transfer. You can do pretty much in any bank. American Express FX also offers it, and you can do it all online. Um, PayPal for samples, and Alipay. Alipay is really nice because that's provided through Alibaba, and they give you a little insurance on your money as well. Next is be very clear and concise on exactly what you want from your supplier. I've had this issue personally in the past. I've had friends that have had this issue you need to be very clear on exactly what you want. If you want your, you're creating something that is a plastic bag, give them the exact thickness of the plastic bag. You want your logo on a certain point on the box, give them the exact measurements of where you want it. Everything needs to be precise and it all needs to be in writing. Write down every single thing you do. I do recommend also talking to your supplier over Skype and downloading WeChat to connect with them directly. It gives you a more personal sense dealing with your supplier and they'll usually down the road have a much better connection with you since you've done quote unquote face to face business with them. But anything you need to go back to, always make sure it's in writing. Also, I prefer to send everything by email, not by Alibaba's messenger system. This just makes it easier down the road to go through and look up an email and everything that you previously talked about. So be clear and concise and everything in writing. Now, the last thing I wanna mention here on this slide is everything is negotiable. Just like truthfully in life, really pretty much everything is negotiable. On Alibaba and when you're dealing with these suppliers, everything there is negotiable from minimum order quantity 
to the price they want, to your shipment times, to your production times. To give you an example, I just talked to a supplier that I deal with. They told me their average production time right now is going to be 35 days. I said, listen, I need it sooner. Okay, we'll do it for you in 25. Every time you talk to them, know that those everything is negotiable. So always negotiate on price. Negotiate on minimum order quantity to start. Always just know that anything you can do is negotiable. Now that we talked about getting your cargo ready and having it shipped to the U.S., let's talk about the customs entry. The customs entry is what lays out all the information of your shipment for customs and any other partnering government agency to review. A customs broker is the one that handles that customs clearance and all of your customs business. They submit the customs entry and prepare any other documentation required. They are always going to be aware of the requirements and rules set forth by customs also known as the regulations. It is their job to inform you, the importer, on how to abide by the regulations. Brokers also typically have specific system requirements as well as permitting bonds that allow them to file on your behalf. Of course, they can only do this once they have your power, signed power of attorney and once you have been set up with the customs bond. Ultimately, it is your responsibility, the importer's responsibility, to provide accurate and complete information in a timely manner to your customs broker and customs. This is called reasonable care. If any importer provides wrong information to the broker or admits certain details regarding the shipment, the importer will be the one subject to the fines and penalties based on the severity. This is why it's so important to make sure your commercial documents are accurate and complete. It is, for be it is best to get them prepared as early in advance as possible this way you can have your broker review it and advise if any corrections need to be made. The commercial invoice should contain many aspects like the buyer, seller, manufacturer, ultimate destination, complete product description, unit value, total value, currency, and the country of origin. The packing list should also contain the buyer, seller, destination, net weight, and gross weight. If more information was required to have your product classified, you should make sure to include those details as well. Same with if your product requires partnering government agency clearance. If your item is going to be subject to FDA, you should contain as many FDA elements as you can. Customs sometimes requires commercial documents to be submitted with the entry or after the entry has been made and this would be need, to, need to be done within a specific time period, so make sure you have them prepared. So before you actually ever order products, you always want to order samples. Even if someone tells you it's the best product in the world, you need to see and feel it to know exactly what it is and know it's exactly the product that you're looking for. So one of the key things when you order samples from a supplier is always order more than one. If you order just one sample, they're gonna pick out the best one that they have and they're gonna send you that best one. My recommendation is order at least five of your samples. That way you can look through, you can make sure that they're all consistent and you can make sure they didn't just pick out the best one and send that best one to you. The next thing is to order your branding on your sample. So rather than just have them send you whatever brand they have with this product already done, you want your own branding on the sample. That way you have a finished product in your hand and you can know exactly what it's going to look like when you receive your order. As I mentioned before, be very, very specific on exactly what you want. If you don't tell them exactly what you want, you're not going to get exactly what you want. Be very specific on each individual feature, where you want your logos, if there's staples in the product, on the packaging, where do you want the staples, how you want the box to close in the packaging. Each little individual thing makes a big difference because that's how your final product's gonna come out. If your samples come in and they don't come exactly how you like it, go back, redo it with the supplier again and order another round of samples. It's worth the extra 100, 200, 500 dollars to get the perfect samples before you place that order. Otherwise, you're gonna get an order that you're unhappy with and then you're stuck with a thousand or 2,000 of the products that aren't exactly what you want. Always make sure you have a perfect sample before you ever order from the supplier. Four samples, as mentioned before. Definitely always pay through PayPal. 
it's an easy way to send money. There's no cost to it for you. Um, it's just really simple. The supplier gets it pretty quickly and they start production the samples very quickly. And if you really have some big issue with the supplier, usually PayPal is pretty good about refunding you. Also, one other thing on the quality of the samples, never ignore something that you think may be a small issue. I've done it personally in the past, one of the first orders I ever had. I thought this was a very small issue with one of my products. Turns out when I got the full order, it turned into a major issue and I had a lot of negative reviews on Amazon because of this issue. So really never ignore anything on your product samples. Make sure you have a perfect, 100% perfect sample before you ever actually place your full order with your supplier. So when you actually get your sample, what do you want to look at? You want to look at how the supplier packages samples in the box they send them in. If your samples are rolling around in the box, it's not a good sign of how they're going to package the main order. You want to look at exactly how they did that. If they put padding in between the samples, nothing was broken, no labels were torn, everything looks really good, that's a really good sign of how they're going to send your main order. Did the supplier deliver the concept of the product exactly as promised? Were the logos in exactly the place you wanted them? You know, were all the features exactly as you asked them for? Were all the products consistent between all, one another? If all these are yes, you're good to go. Place your next order. It's pretty simple from there, but make sure 100% that you have a perfect sample before you ever proceed to order from your supplier. So you got that perfect sample, you placed your order, you're now waiting on delivery, your delivery arrives. You decide here if you're gonna send all your inventory to Amazon. This really depends on your storage space. So Amazon storage can end up costing a lot more than a small storage unit that you have locally. However, having a small locally owned storage unit requires you to go every month or two months or whatever time you decide to that storage unit and resend inventory to Amazon. It's a lot more legwork on your end, but it can lower your inventory costs. Now, when you're just starting out, this especially is a good idea because Amazon has inventory charges they charge at the six month or more mark. These are much larger fees. So if you have a new product and your MOQ is a large amount, consider using a separate storage space at the beginning at least to store those products. When your order arrives, you wanna have a checklist that you keep in mind when you're receiving your product. A few things on that checklist. Make sure your order quantity is correct. When your order arrives, your truck driver is gonna hand you what's called a manifest. The shipping manifest is gonna have how many pallets or how many boxes are within your order. As they put them down, make sure you're going through and physically checking off exactly the amount you received. If you don't do this, you can end up missing a box or even an entire pallet. From there, you want to spot check the boxes. So open up a couple random boxes. If you have an order of 1,000 pieces that are in 50 boxes, I would say spot check 5 to 10 boxes. Just open them up, look inside, pull out a couple units, Make sure it's exactly what you ordered. Make sure they all look consistent. It's really easy. Just spot check them to make sure everything's okay. Now, what do you do if something is wrong or something is missing? First is figure out where the fault lies. If you're missing a pallet or you're missing some boxes, talk to the truck driver. See if it was on the manifest. If it's on the manifest and it just didn't arrive, then you need to contact your shipping company, which most likely would be Shapiro, and figure out maybe if a pallet didn't arrive from the boat, if a pallet wasn't loaded on the truck. Um, just figure out exactly what happened there. Now, if you start opening up the boxes and you're missing units from the boxes, then you need to say, let's say you have boxes are supposed to be 25 and you only have 20 units in the box, contact the manufacturer with this issue. Find out what went wrong. Most likely the manufacturer will want to make this issue up to you and they'll reship you the, um, the units they were missing or they'll wait to your next order and tack them on that order as well. If the inventory is not the same as the samples, 
this can be a major issue. You need to talk to the manufacturer. At this point also, if you ordered through Alibaba and through Alipay, you want to message Alipay and open up a case immediately. Alipay only allows you to open up a case for the first 30 days after you receive the order. So you want to get on that immediately just so you're covered in case the manufacturer doesn't respond or doesn't respond well to this issue. Most likely though, if you followed my rules about the samples, you're not going to have this issue. So in case you haven't heard, the U.S. has issued a new proclamation called Section 301, Additional Duties on Certain Items from China. This would be based off the tariff number used and only for items with the country of origin as China, um, meaning mainland China only, so Taiwan and Hong Kong are exempt from this proclamation. As of right now, it is currently broken out into three lists with specific tar tariff numbers identified. List 1 and List 2 have already been implemented and impose an additional 25% tariff on the goods. List 3, which is the largest list, is currently imposing a 10% additional duty and has yet to have an implementation date. There has recently been talk that the President will initiate this sooner rather than later due to the China retaliation. And in addition to that, they are planning on bumping it up from 10% to 25%. I know Shapiro is on there toe is waiting to hear what happens next. With that being said, aside from the obvious additional duties to be paid by the importer, there's a few other changes you can expect to see. First would be a higher cost of production, which as you mentioned, could also depend on your INCO terms. If your importer is covering your duties, excuse me, if your supplier is covering your duties, they will be shown in your invoice price. Or if you decide to start sourcing elsewhere, they will know that they that you are going to be fairly desperate to source other than China, and they can raise their prices. Another thing to note is vessel and aircraft space will be filling up quickly with those who are trying to beat implementation of List 3. If List 3 is implemented while your cargo is in the air or on the water, then you will still be subject to those additional duties because it will be based off the day the cargo arrives in the U.S. We have already begun seeing more CF-28s, also known as Request for Information, and CF-29s, which is Notice of Action, being sent out from Customs. They are aware that there are going to be people who are classifying their items under one number, even though they do belong under a different tariff number. They are being very thorough, so make sure you have all of your supporting documentation ready, especially since these forms come with strict timelines. Importers can also expect to see more customs exams. CBP is opening boxes and containers and making sure the invoice and commercial documents are matching what they find. One thing to note is if you have been importing under one classification and recently changed it to another just to avoid this duty, that will raise a major red flag with customs. You can see a hefty fine based on what they find when opening your containers. So uh, now that you guys have learned all about shipping and everything else, we did want to cover uh, a secret marketing tip that at Private Label Hero we, we teach and we talk about. Uh, this is specifically for those that send out um, any sort of uh, products with, with small packages. One of, the, one of the key things that we found is that Amazon kind of controls your business. It, 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 dictates what you can and can't do through their email systems. And so one of the things that we've found is that by giving a little insert card uh, into their into our products uh, that encourages people to go off of Amazon and onto a website where they can enter an email to get a 10% off or 20% off or free shipping or some sort of a coupon code. Um, we always called it our VIP members club or VIP list for your business. We include this into the packages, and so when they open it, the first thing that they do is they see this card that encourages them to sign up on our email list to get 20% off their next order. So if they really like your product, then the likelihood of them going to your website and signing up for your email list is really high. So 
it's very important to build your own email list so that when you have holidays that come around, like let's say uh, if you're in like a, a men's product and, and Father's Day comes around, well now you've got an email list of people who've per previously bought your product. So some of the things that we used our email list for was when we launched a new product, when we launched a um, like a separate product in our, our product line, when we launched a new color uh, during important holidays, um, and so the front of your card, we always got some sort of attention getting headline like um, stop what you're doing, important information on the other side of this card. Uh, and that, you know, that will encourage people to at least look at the card. Um, and then on the back side, that's where we it, um, get them into, it says congratulations, your auto qualifies for free access to our VIP club. Register now for instant access to our VIP club. Now what's important that we found converted really high was only available for the first three days after you purchase your product. So besides the card, what we then had was we had a specific landing page that was set up. Um, you can use three different types, unbounce, um, click funnels, um, there's all kinds of different landing pages, websites out there, but we made it a subdomain of our actual business. So in this case, it would have been stopfidgeting.com slash VIP. So they go there and then it redirects them to a specific landing page and the only thing on the page is, um, is just an email sign up with what they were looking for. Um, and so using this really simple secret marketing tip, it allows you to market to a list that is off of Amazon where you can direct them to your website, direct them to any other um, store you want, allows you to cross promote with other products, all kinds of different things. But the main thing with this is you want an attention getting uh, line on the front. You want the, to, to hook them in with something that's really going to hook them in 50% off their next order, 20% off their next order. And then all of the traffic goes to a website with only one single goal, which is an email sign up. And so this secret marketing tip helped us to generate a lot more sales for this business, but also a lot of our other businesses as well. All right, wonderful. So if you've got any questions, bring them on. This is our little Q&A session. You should be able to see a chat area feature that is uh, on the side when you logged in. Uh, or you can always send us an email. Uh, me and my team here at Shapiro, we can be contacted at ecom at shapiro.com. And Max and our friends at Private Label Hero can be contacted via their email at support at privatelabelhero.com. I'm going to reach out here for a second. Do we have any uh, questions that are coming through the chat right now? No questions. All right. Give that another second okay. before we kind of close. Sorry? Oh, no. Sorry. I hit my phone. Oh, no worries. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We're going to send out that digital packet that we talked about, some extra information to help bolster everything that you learned in our session today. Again, feel free to reach out to us to get more information about anything that you're looking for. Uh, we really enjoyed having you today. Thanks again for coming to the webinar. Thanks. Thanks.